Uh, Genesis chapter 3, you pray for me this morning. Verse number 1 said, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, if God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, or the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Father, help us today. I pray to feed the church of God, which you purchased with your own blood. Lord, I pray that sinners' eyes would be open to the truth of the Word of God, that be saved and drawn to repentance and faith. Lord, I pray for the saint that's got weary and well-doing, that's drifting. I pray for them today that you would help them, hold them up, and help them to see, Lord, we want them back, you want them back. And I pray, God, you restore that joy for them today. We love you and thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to try to preach just a little bit today, if I could, on some questions you must answer. And uh, I've been reading my Bible through, and sometimes I'll read my Bible through in different ways. Sometimes I'll read it in alphabetical order, the books of the Bible. And sometimes I'll pick out a word, like I read it through one time, and everywhere I saw Israel, I would highlight it. Because you hear so much about prophecy, and I thought, you know, well, just every time you hear Israel in the Bible, just highlight it, and you'll find out what God said about it. And by the way, uh, Israel wins. Uh, you don't have to worry about it. And uh, they come out on top, amen, just because uh, somebody throws an M80 over in Palestine and it goes off, it does not mean that World War III is getting ready to break out. I found that out by reading that, amen. But I have been reading uh, my Bible through and uh, I'm just about done. And uh, uh, I don't care if they do have a book about this, every question in the Bible, I'm, I'm just putting it down. And you know, God asks a lot of questions. Uh, right now, our world has a lot of questions. Uh, you know, and uh, they'll give you a different answer. If you're Dr. Fauci, you take a nap, and you've got a different answer every time you wake up. Amen. Amen. If you're the CDC, you can't make up your mind what you're going to do. And all these questions keep rolling in, and uh, nobody seems to have the right answer. Well, you know, when you witness to people or somebody wants to give you a hard time what they do, they're all the time they'll ask one question, and after that they'll ask another question. And in prison, what I do when they start asking questions, and I answer all these questions for them, and they just keep answering them, I say, look, I've got better things to do than stand here and waste my time asking them, uh, answering a bunch of questions that you really don't want the answer to. And I move on. I've got other things to do. But I tell people that every once in a while, God is going to ask you a question. And when God asks you a question, you're going to have to answer it whether you want to or not. Uh, whether you make the choice or not, Jesus said, if you're uh, not with me, you're against me. If you're not gathering with me, you're scattering abroad. And basically he's saying, look, I'm going to pick the side for you. If you don't pick it, eventually I'm going to uh, make that uh, choice for you. And uh, But when you're out there and, and uh, the, all these questions are being thrown around, and by the way, can I say this? And I, I'm, I kid with my son, and, and I tell him, I said, it's uh, so awesome being right all the time. <laughs> you know, and you ought to do your kids that way. Just remind them, hey, I'm awesome and I know everything. Somebody told me one time, they said, you think you know everything. I said, I got a verse on that. <laughs> 1 John 2, 20, and you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. Now, is that not true? Can I tell you something? Emmanuel Baptist Church, God's people, they have the answer for what's L in Florence, Kentucky. You come over here, some of your questions have been answered. You got your family back. You got your kids back. You got saved. Uh, there's been some of you been rescued from uh, terrible lives, and some of you, uh, you know, you were sitting on a pew and you've been raised in church your whole life, and then one day you found somebody brave enough to preach to you, and you got saved by the grace of God. Ain't that a wonderful thing? Cause you know why? Because you had the answer. Amen. 
And the world's going to ask some questions sometimes that uh, don't even deserve an answer. You know, when Jesus would ask the question a uh, time or two, especially with a woman taken in the very act of adultery, they said, Moses said, he just started writing in the dirt. He didn't answer their question. He just responded. He said, he that is out sin, let him cast the first stone. Some questions you don't even need to waste your time with. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 23 said, uh, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strife. Uh, some questions are asked. Some of these godless questions, these foolish questions about Jesus. Well, was he married? And, uh, you know, they, they, when they're talking about his moral character and things of that nature, I don't even waste my time with those things. He, those uneducated questions, those are those uh, just uh, the only word I can think of is dumb. Yep. Amen. They're just dumb questions, and dumb questions don't deserve a good answer. But here in this passage of Scripture, uh, the devil is attacking the first home. He's going to attack yours. And uh, the first thing he does, he comes up and he's very subtle. I tell people, if you think you're smarter than the devil, and a lot of people do, right. they think they're smarter than the devil. If he can come up to a man like Adam and Eve, and uh, uh, people who had no bad environment, who were like God, they'd have no uh, vulgar or vile thoughts in their life or in their minds. They lived in a society where God would talk to them in the cool of the day. And he convinced them to sin. But I've got one better than that. If uh, the, the anointed cherub that could cover Lucifer, the son of the morning, can stand where you want to be, uh, and he stood there, and uh, he was right next to God, saw him every day, if he can convince angels to abandon heaven and try to overthrow God, he's much smarter than you'll ever be. Don't think you're slicker than the devil. If you think it can't happen to me or my family or my children, you are fooling yourself. Amen. And you're going to be made a fool of eventually just like they were. And the Bible said that uh, he came up to her and he said unto the woman, Yea, God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The very first question in the Bible. That's the first question God ever asked, or the that was ever asked in the Bible, and the devil asked it. Yea, if God said, and that's still the word of the day. That's still the question of the day. He said, yea, if God said, that's what he talked to that woman about. And let me say this, sir, she was deceived. The man, he just gave in to the sin. He was not deceived. He went into it wide open. He, uh, the devil deceived her, and the man, for whatever reason, he knew what was going on, and he, he purposely walked into that thing. That's why the Bible said, For by one man sin, death, uh, sin entered in the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all men have sinned. God holds the man responsible for what goes on down this house. Even though the woman was deceived, God said the man allowed that to get into this world. And by the way, it was a misdemeanor that got sin into the world. She ate something she wasn't supposed to. You know, shoplifting. And uh, look, uh, uh, somebody says, is it important what we eat? I said, that's how sin got here, and our diet has been killing us ever since. So you need to be real careful. That's why I told the ch uh, church at Corinth, whatever you eat or whatever you drink, he said you do it all to the glory of God, so it does matter. The smallest matters matter, but he told her, he said, yeah, God said, you know the first thing he did? He said, I want you to doubt what God said. You know what people do? Well, how do you know the Bible's true? It's called faith. It's called faith. Look, he said, yea, if God said, and this is the first question that Satan used, and uh, he'll try to get you to question the Bible. When you go over to Hebrews chapter 11, he said, by faith. And look here, faith is going on what you know, not what you feel. 
Not what you see. You know why you get up some mornings and you don't feel saved, but you keep marching on anyway? Because you know you're saved. You know you're saved because what God said. No matter what you are got going on, you know that God has controlled that thing even though it seemed like it's falling apart. You know what? You say, look, I know that it looks like it's uh, falling apart, but God Almighty has got his hand on it, and we're going to be all right. We're going to get through this thing. But he said, look here, now faith is a substance of things hoped for in Hebrews 11.1. 1. That substance is our foundation. Look, you've got to have faith in what God said. You've got faith in something, but I've got faith in my Bible. I tell people I know when I die I'm going to heaven. I'm going to go to heaven. They say, how do you know that? God said so. I believe in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. How do you know that to be true? Because God said so. I don't need nothing else. God told me and that's a good enough enough for me. Amen. Like a child that looks at that father, he thinks it could hang the moon. He said, look, my daddy said so, and that's all that matters to me. I trust him totally and completely. It's called faith. Boy, you got your faith in it. And he, and he tells her, look, he said, it, it's, a, it's a evidence of things not seen. He said, for by the elders obtained a good report. You ever seen that smart elk knows everything? He's got faith in the science and uh, that's changing his textbooks every other year. He's got it, like I said, he's got it in man who has uh, faltered ever since the first one of us uh, took a step on this planet and they've changed your mind, they've changed their course. Hey man, we can't even decide what we're going to wear some days and we act like we're going to trust them guys take care of us. But look here, by El, look here, you just trust God and you'll obtain a good report too. Here in Hebrews 11, he said, Through faith we understand the worlds were, were, were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. There's a God I've never seen. You know what? He just spoke it into existence. You read the first uh, uh, the two chapters of the Bible and God created everything but man. And then he created man. And you know what? That tells me everything that man would ever need. God had it ready for him before he ever showed up. And you know what? One of these days you're going to get in a jam. You're going to be in a place you don't know what you're going to do. You just need to remember that God, oh, our God Almighty has already got over there what you need to take care of that problem. But anyhow, let me move on here. I've said in the seminary classes, I've been to two of them and I'm not opposed to them. And I've heard a lot of great men preach. I've got a lot of their books in my library, and I read them a lot. But when I used to hear the originals, that would always, I, it would always have a question in my mind. And then when I read things like I've heard some men preach in some big meetings, and I read their books, and one of them I read this. He said the Greek translation which Jesus and the apostles used was not a good translation. I thought, son, your PhD has drove you C-R-A-Z-Y. <laughs> Amen? You got a degree in crazy if you think that the Word of God Himself is corrupt. When He was preaching, you say, look, He used a corrupt translation. You know what that is? My job as a preacher is to get you to trust the Bible, not to doubt the Bible. <laughs> Any preacher, anywhere he's at, in a seminary, in a pulpit, and I'm sick and tired myself, and you can tell them I said so, they can tell you what the Greeks and the Hebrews say, and what all them words mean, and none of them can carry on a conversation in Greek or Hebrew. Just because you got a strong concordance, they think they got it all together. You know why God gave us an English Bible? So we could understand what he said. God don't mince his words. But he said, look, 2 Corinthians 2, 17, he said, for we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. What better place to corrupt the Bible than right here? When you got people that said, hey man, that guy's got an education in Bible. He's been off to some of the greatest seminaries. He's wrote books. Big deal. Darwin wrote a book. He was wrong too. Amen. Look here, friend. Like one guy said on the show, he mentioned something about somebody doing something. He said, hey, the devil used to work for God, so what's your point? Right. Good. <laughs> Amen. Now look here. Jesus said there'd be wolves in sheep's clothing. 
Why would I tell you God didn't really mean that when God wrote it down in black and white? And we put it in English so we could all understand it. But anyway, 1 Corinthians 2, 14, can I say this? We can make the Bible as plain as the ABCs. But can I tell you, that don't mean sinners going to believe it. Because the Bible tells us that the Word of God's foolishness to them. The Bible tells in 1 Corinthians 2, 14, the natural man, that's the unsaved man. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness unto them, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. When a lost man opens up the Bible and he reads God created, he chuckles. When he reads that uh, God took five loaves, uh, five loaves of bread and two fish, fed a multitude, he laughs hysterically. When he raises the dead and done all that he did, he died on the cross, was buried, and rose again by his own power. They said that is foolish to believe such stuff but they believe a lot of foolish stuff Daniel chapter 12 and verse 10 said the wicked shall do wickedly in the last days and he said the wicked shall not understand it's amazing how confused they are and they act like everybody else is too but we're not right. Right. Amen. Amen. amen when you start doubting the Bible you'll deny the Bible amen, amen. amen. Yep. and uh he said, you shall not surely die. He filled in the place. Yeah, did God really say that? See, God told the man that. He didn't tell the woman that. And the man passing on to the woman, she trusted the man. Then the devil got to whisper in her ear, and he convinced her, hey, I know more than your husband. Now, I know some of you women in here know a whole lot more than your husbands. I'm looking at them right now. Okay? But look here. He got to doubt in God. She came to a crossroads and, and she had to make up her mind. Who am I going to believe? Am I going to believe God or Satan? Am I going to believe what God that walks with me in the cool of the day that's done all this for me? Or am I, am I going to believe this serpent that talks by the way? And he said, am I going to believe this creature that God made with his own hand? Amen. Talking serpent. You better watch him. Amen. It's kind of like talking horse, Mr. Ed, you know. But she, she believed the devil. I want to ask you a question. Who are you going to believe today? Amen. Who are you going to believe? You're going to get a chance to prove that here in a minute. But look here. Uh, he started denying what God said. Hebrews eleven six. That he said, "But by, by, without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him." When you come to Jesus Christ, you've got to believe He is the answer, not part of the answer. It's not like AA that you can have a Harley Davidson or Jesus Christ as your as your source. Look, it's got to be Him. You've tried everything else. You went to psychologists. You tried the pill. You tried education. You made a ton of money. And all that stuff leads you wanting. And when you come to him, you've got to believe that he is the answer for your trouble. But anyway, let me move on here. He gives them, look here. He'll get you to doubt the Bible, deny the Bible. Then you get plumb delusional. He said there in verse 5, you shall be as gods. Who don't want to be that? Amen. You can be Superman, Superwoman. Who wouldn't want all them powers and abilities? You're going to be just like him. He don't want that. Because see, if you become like him, you're his equal. Can I tell you something? You'll never be his equal. Amen. As far as the heavens is or from earth, that's how far our thoughts and ways are. Amen. You know what? We've lowered his deity so high. And we've eleva elevated humanity to a level where we're buddies. Can I tell you, God is not my buddy. Right. Jesus Christ is not the man upstairs. Right. He's a God Almighty. Right. And you'll address Him as such. Amen. He ain't going to fool you much. But anyway, you know what sin will do? It'll make you smarter than those narrow-minded Christians, what He'll tell you. Look here, when you go to college... It's amazing. You get out of the car. You don't even have to have your foot on the first parking lot pavement, and you know everything. You know why? Because you're a student at a university, and you know everything. <laughs> your parents are stupid, even though they're paying for everything. They're idiots, and you know everything. 
because you're a student in college. They feel that way coming out of seminaries too. You ask them. They've got every answer to every Bible question that's ever been asked. They've got the answer. I'm thinking, you're dumb. I'm 60. I know I look older. I can't help it. But I tell people, look, the older I get, the dumber I realize I've been. Wouldn't it be a blessing if you could take the wisdom and knowledge of a 60-year-old and put it in a 20-year-old head? Life would be great. Well, look, they ain't going to see it either a bit more than I did. And they're going to try to convince them, and they ain't going to listen to you either. So there you go. You're going to get paid back. But anyway, look at these same people that will tell you that God didn't create it. Now, look, I've read, I've read a lot of stuff. My whales.org, I read a, uh, 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 an article one time. And here's what they said, and I read two or three because I thought this cannot be the truth. You cannot really believe this. So I checked two or three other scientific articles and it was the truth to them. They said that whales, uh, the biggest aquatic uh, mammal, is that what it is, a mammal in the ocean, that it once lived upon the land and it probably evolved from a deer or a pig. <laughs> That's a guy that's got a Ph.D. in ignorance. Amen. I mean, this guy don't believe that God created man out of the dust of the earth, but he'll tell you that a whale used to be a pig or a deer. I'm telling you, you crippled two eyes for crutches. You need to sue your brain for non-support if you are that ignorant. Amen. That's right. So the next time you eat uh, bacon, think, man, this whale meat's good. <laughs> Yeah, if God said, you're going to believe what God said? Right. If a man dies, shall he live again? Yeah. You'll find out the answer to that question when you exhale your last time. Amen. Amen. Read low. I don't know how your paper is right here. A lot of people that's cremated serves to be announced later on. In other words, they're going to cremate you, stick you in an urn somewhere, and act like you was never here. How awful. I would hate to think that people thought of me that little. Now look, the greatest preacher that ever lived, there just a handful of people came to his funeral, carried him to the grave and cried over him, John the Baptist. So I'm not looking for some great, huge funeral. But look, I want somebody to miss me. My wife and son is over there. If I died, uh, you all, I think you all like me for the most part, and I like you all a lot. But at my gravesite, when we're walking away, Two weeks, a month down the road, they're going to be grieving, hurting, and crying. Everybody else, before they get to the car, they're going to be saying, where are we going to eat at? Yeah. Amen? <laughs> if a man dies, shall he live again? Job 14, 14. He asked that question. He said, all the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Do you know there's going to be a time when you will change? You change here. You know, I mean, there's a baby at our church. I watched him at the altar one day. He's like uh, three months old. And he clasped his little hands like this. And he crossed his eyes like that. And he stuck his tongue out like this. And he went... <laughs> and everybody laughed. You do that when you're a teenager, they're going to commit you somewhere. <laughs> Amen? It's cute when you're in diapers, you look really weird. If you live long enough, you may do that when you get old. I don't know. But look, you're going to change whether you believe it or not. Look here in Luke 16, it said the beggar died. The beggars die. These people wandering around on the streets, you see they're going to die one day. That ought to bother you that they're not going to go to heaven if they're not saved. But he said the rich man died also. And look, the beggar was comforting. The rich man is tormented. One of them went to heaven, the other went to hell. Can I tell you something, friend? It ought to bother you that people are going to hell. When I said drunk staggering down the road, I'm thinking, how did that guy get there? There's a preacher friend of mine. He got out of the will of God, and he told me himself. He's fixed everything. He's back in church. He said, and I used to preach for this guy. And he said, Larry, he said, I was sitting on a street corner, homeless, with a liquor bottle in my hand, thinking, how did I get here? How did I get here? 
And you know what? He's like the prophet. He got his mind back and he got right with God. He's got, everything's good now. Family, it's all good. Ain't that a blessing? But look here. There's an appointed time. You're going to die somewhere. Now look, I don't know when my time is, but look, I tell my son all the time, I want to live to the line. Amen. Job 14, 5 said, Seeing that his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee, that is a point his bounds that he cannot pass. Hey, there's a line out there that God said, You're not going to pass it no matter what's going on. I want to live to the line, not a second longer do I want to live. I want to live as long as God wants me to. I want to die when God says for me to die. Ecclesiastes 3, 2, there's a time to be born and a time to die. Amen. And even between between there, I'm going to try to do the best I can to be a good representative of Him. Amen. Amen. It, it, it's, it's an appointed time, but it's also an anticipated time if you're saved. Yeah. You live long enough. Some of you older people here, you know what I'm talking about. I'm an old man now. I'm 60. Like I said, I've said it two or three times. It's because I just joined the club. <laughs> when you're 60, you're not young anymore. I don't care what they say. Now, I'm probably the healthiest, the strongest, the fastest old man you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> but I am in the club. You know, I call myself old. I call really old people Jurassic. <laughs> They're in the Jurassic Club. I told this one lady back home, she said, I've only got four teeth. I said, well, you are 100. <laughs> you can make them jokes when you're old. Because I said, he's old too. I told him, matter of fact, when you get him pulled to the dentist office, save him. Throw him in a field somewhere. And a paleontologist will find him one day and say, dinosaurs used to roam this land. <laughs> I know that was awful, but it was funny. Because you're laughing too. <laughs> Amen. But look here. If you're saved, you live long enough and you think I've seen enough. I've heard enough, I've experienced enough, my heart has been broken up, and all I want to do is I want to go to heaven. My mother died about four, almost five years ago, and she died two years before we buried her. She said, I'm sick of this place. She'd outlived five of her children, and the look, God let her die like they did in old yeller. The rest of us seven was around her bed. She said, I got five kids, and I want to go well, and see them. Look here, I was there when she died, just me and her. Hey, look, about three o'clock in the morning, she was reaching toward heaven, begging God to let her die. No no fear. You know why? Because he's dead. And I watched her cross over and one of these days I'm going to be over there. Yeah. I used to hear old people say I got more over there than I do here. Trust me. Find out. Look, you young people here. Yeah, look, if you're a teenager working at McDonald's making a payment on a low rider, be excited. You'll be old soon enough. Right. And that stuff will get on your nerves too. <laughs> Amen lime green trucks and loud music it bothers me I'm old it don't bother those guys it shouldn't but look here houses and cars and raising your kids and give, you young families need to be interested in all that stuff you live long enough and you get all that stuff behind you and you think man the only thing left is heaven and I really want to go there amen, amen. but anyway Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 2 for this, for in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from above. Paul said, I've got something inside me that's yearning and groaning. I want to go to heaven for Philippians 1.23 for me to live as Christ but to die as gain. He said, I've got to do something down here. He said, but really in my heart, I want to go to heaven. Amen. Amen. What a blessing that's going to be. It's going to be an altering time. You know, we've got, we've even got face banks now. They can transplant faces. They can give you somebody else's heart, lungs, all that. I think it's pretty good. I mean, if you're rich enough and they perfect that thing, it's going to be good. Because I've been ugly my whole life. I'm going to get me a new face. <laughs> That's right. That's it. But anyway, that's just crazy thinking it. I think crazy. I can't help it. But, but look here. 1 Corinthians, he said things are going to change. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 
In verse 51, Behold, I show you mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of the eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and we shall be changed. He said, For this mortal must put on immortality. Right. Ain't that a blessing? Right. I mean, you or one of these days, God is going to change you from what you are to something supernatural. Right. Amen. I had another crazy thought. Heard a guy preach one time. He said, We shall know as we are known. And I thought, Good Lord, I'm going to be ugly for eternity. <laughs> but it won't matter in heaven, I don't guess. But anyway. But look here, let me ask one more question. It's 10 after I'm way ahead of schedule. He asked this question in Galatians 3 Received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? You're going to have to answer that question. Amen. Look here, you're going to get that question answered about dying. Uh, we all know we're going to die, and we don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that morbid thought. You can't live if you just live there all the time. But you've got to know, hey, there's something after this. Look here, anybody has got a, a lick of sense will tell you there's something different than just here. Amen? But anyway... He asked him this question. He said, Receive this spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. That is a question you're going to have to answer. How do I get right with God? How do I go to heaven? You've got to answer that question. And, uh, you know, they must have gave it a ridiculous answer because uh, he said, Are you so foolish? In verse 3. Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? He said, You've done nothing to get the spirit of God. And so you do nothing to keep the Spirit of God. They was trying to mix the two together. Can I tell you something? If you're a Baptist, you'll be baptized. You know what I'm saying? That, that is, uh, uh, it, it's something that we do. That's, how, that's where the world, we're just Baptists. We baptize. We, we fully immerse. We dunk you totally and completely. But that don't save you. That's not a part of salvation. Look here, keeping the Ten Commandments, and men and brother was talking about before church, most people are going to keep the Ten Commandments, go to heaven, they can't even name them off. Amen? Now look here, I want to ask you this. You know yourself, you lived to yourself all week. Have you lived good enough to go to heaven this week? That's any age group. We know these kids have been into something. Amen? Matter of fact, we're going to tell something on him. I mean, this guy right here, we're going to tell something on that guy in the blue shirt. Yeah. That's right. But look here. But us old people, we know we ain't been good enough to go to heaven this week. When you get old, it don't mean you're good. I know a bunch of hateful, grumpy, mean old people. And now I'm old enough to say, look, you're mean, you're old, you're grumpy, and you're just awful. You're ugly inside and out, so cut it out. Amen. But anyway, he told him, he said, you got to repent. You ready to quit what you're doing? We live in a generation now you can get saved and you don't have to quit nothing. That ain't what the Bible teaches. He still says drunkards don't go. He still says that all liars shall have their part in the lake with barren of a fire and brimstone. He said the fearful and the unbelieving just as well as the murderers and the people like that. He said they're all going to go to the lake of fire if they don't repent of their sin. Amen, Matthew 3, 2. He said, repent ye. God hadn't spoken 400 years. And the first thing God said to mankind, He said, you need to repent. We need to quit a bunch of stuff. We're cutting our own throat. You need to look at how many billions of dollars we spend every year on alcohol in this country. Just go look it up today. Uh, you need to look, 98,000 drug overdoses in America during COVID. So they're dropping dead every day. Can I tell you, it ain't the doctor's fault. It, it ain't the pharmacist's fault. Yeah, look here, friend, they're looking for something that's never gave an answer to anything. They're looking everywhere but up. Amen. Repent. Look here, we're cutting our own throat. There's a lot of things if we just quit it. Hey, you know what? If you get married, 
and you stay married to one person for the rest of your life and have a monogamous relationship, you know what? You don't have to worry about no venereal disease whatsoever. The perversion of AIDS and all that. Look here, the hemophiliacs can't help it. But look here, the, the homos can. Yep. Right. Amen. Deviant behavior. And we're wanting something to fix all of our deviant behavior. Yep. Just quit it. Yep. Right. But anyway, Luke 24 and 46, And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to raise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem he said you need to repent of your sin look I've not been sinless since I got saved but I've sinned a whole lot less you're not going to be sinless when you get saved but you'll sin a whole lot less I don't care what age you are I first got saved I, I, I don't like to talk a whole lot about it I remember an old buddy of mine, he threw a cigar out the window. And it didn't have tobacco in it. So you figure out the rest. And he said, this is ours. I said, oh no. And I used to love that stuff. He said, this is ours. God, look here. No, my parents wasn't around. None of my buddies was around. This is an old friend who I'm not better than. I'm just better off then. I said, that's not ours. That's yours. I got saved, man. I had to make a choice. I repented of my sins. Right. I was different, amen? But anyway, you got to receive. You repent. You're turned away from what you're leaving. You got to get something to fill the void. God receive, Acts 26, 20, and that they should repent and turn to God. Yeah. Amen? God can do for what nobody else can. Hey, that's right. Amen? Second Corinthians 1, 22, he said, Who all... So has saved us, sealed us, and given us the earnest of His Spirit in our hearts. In my heart, I feel Him sometimes. Amen. Now, I'm, I'm an emotional guy. I'm a guy. I'm emotional when I watch sports. I like to see my team win. I told you before. I love the UFC, and I love when my guy knocks the other guy out, and he's cold, out cold for like ten minutes. Yeah. I said, yeah, he clipped him. You know, I get emotional. About this day I got saved, I was very emotional. I'd never read the Bible before I got saved. I thought everybody preached in prison would be a heathen like I was. Most of them were raised in churches just like this. They knew, more, they knew more about God than some preachers I know right now. Yeah. Wow. Amen. They knew the story, but they ain't done nothing with it. Right. And, uh, but I got emotional, man. I got saved. I could feel him. I was like that one with this year, but I could feel it. Yeah. Amen? He put something in my heart. I received God. Let me read this, and I'll quit. It's about 17 after. Let me throw this out here, and then we'll quit. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3. This is the Apostle Paul. He was raised like most of these young people in this church right here. He had a life like most of us. Most of us have had. Here's what he said. Philippians 3, 3, for with a circumcision, and circumcision is talking about uh, cutting away the flesh. He's talking about Gentile and Jew believers alike, which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. We're not trusting anything our flesh does. Now he's talking about in the religious sense here. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, He's telling these guys, if anybody can trust to rely on the flesh, if any other man thinketh he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I'm more. I had a guy tell me one time when I first got saved, I was witness to him, he said, I've never sinned since I got saved. I said, you just lied. So that's a sin. Right. Amen. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, the Hebrew of the Hebrews, is touching the law of Pharisee, Concerning zeal, that means being excited about what you're doing, his church work in this case. Persecuting the church, very zealous about killing God's people. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. I kept those Ten Commandments, what he's saying. I kept those laws that you don't hear a whole lot about. I kept them all. But what, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. 
Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Paul said, I kept all them laws. I was like that rich young ruler. He come up and he said, what commandments do I need to keep? He named them off. He said, I've kept all them from my youth up. You know what I told him? He said, I'm a good guy. If we looked at him, we'd say, he's a good guy. But Jesus said, you lack one thing. That's all it takes, one thing. You know, when I had cancer back in 2007, I was watching my diet. I was running five miles a day, doing martial arts five, six days a week. I mean, I was in tip-top shape. And that doctor said, man, you got the, he said, you got the vitals of a teenager. I was 47, 48-year-old. He said, if you didn't have this cancer, I said, that's all it takes. Just one thing. No matter what's blood pressure, you've got cancer, you've got problems. Paul said, I've done all that from my youth up. I'm a good boy, but on the road to Damascus, God said, you know what? You ain't good enough. You quit all the meanness you want to and start doing all the goods you want to. And some of you, you're too old to catch up. You'll never get caught up. You're way behind. And look here, you young people, you'll never do good enough that way you're bad. you got to trust Jesus Christ. And he said, look... He said, I've learned how to trust Christ. Not my own righteousness. Look here, everybody looks out the door nowadays and they think, it's not me, it's the world. I'm good. No, the only reason you're good is because God made you good. The only reason I get to go to heaven is because Jesus Christ saved me and said I could go. That's the only reason I'm going. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.